Welcome everyone um, to, to our webinar today. Um, so first of all, just to introduce myself, my name is Verity Warren and I'm Director of Communications and Engagement at INAPS. I'll introduce you in more detail to the other panelists shortly, um, but I just wanted to do a very little bit of, of scene setting before, um, before we get uh, started fully. So universities are obviously very important sites to nurture the skills and the potential of young people, our future leaders, that will transform society. But to achieve this, they must offer spaces where the talents of all students, men and women, can thrive. Getting women into university is obviously incredibly important, but this is only one part of the problem if learning environments then constrain women's participation and interaction in a way that limits their opportunities to learn and compete with their male peers. We see change starting with university educators, how they teach and the spaces that they create in their classroom that will help improve the prospects of women students, but also um, by changing mindsets of all students that can instill new professional values that will then transform gender relations in the workplace too. Today, we're going to be talking to you about a new framework that's been developed and piloted as part of the Transforming Employability for Social Change in East Africa Partnership, TESIA Partnership. So TESIA supports four universities, um, two in Uganda and two in Tanzania, to create an improved learning experience that develops critical thinking and problem solving skills to improve the employability of both women and men. But when uh, the TESIA project was looking at research on gender responsive pedagogy, we found that the focus had been very much on northern education systems or in the south on primary and secondary education. So the approach that the TESIA partnership has developed is tailored to the educational context of higher education in East Africa. So far, we've trained over 148 lecturers. We've redesigned 87 courses and reached um, over eight, uh, uh, 1,800 students and also have now created a community of expert facilitators. And we've seen behaviours change and lecturers becoming really passionate about becoming gender responsive teachers. And we now have a model that we believe is scalable to other universities and regions. And that's what we want to talk to you about today. So here to talk to you is, uh, is a great panel. We have um, my scope guard from INAS, Professor Flora Fabian from the University of Dodoma, and Isibo Esamada from Uganda, uh, Martyrs University in Uganda. So please don't forget to post questions in the chat um, and we'll collate them for the Q&A later. So we'll go first to Mai. Um, Mai Skogard is a program specialist and manager of the Tessier project, Transforming Employability for Social Change in South Africa. Prior to INAS, my works in NGOs within Denmark and Jordan, and during her six years, INAS has worked across a number of projects to develop the capacity of research and knowledge systems in Africa, the Middle East, and also Latin America. So my over to you. Thank you, Verity. Uh, so when we first started uh, as part of the TESIA project uh, to look at gender uh, and pedagogy, uh, and build uh, a framework and approach for how we could uh, work um, with gender responsive pedagogy in TESIA. Um, we looked at the work of the Forum of African Women Educationalists, FAWE, uh, and particularly we, we looked at their teacher's handbook for gender responsive pedagogy. Um, and so building on that, uh, we have looked um, at pedagogy as a concept that embraces virtually all teaching and learning process. So within the context of the classroom, we've looked uh, as a pedagogy in terms, um, as a term that includes what is taught, so the content that is being taught, how teaching takes place, so the teaching process, uh, as well as how what is taught is taught, so the teaching methods. Um, and we've taken gender responsive pedagogy to refer to the teaching and learning processes that pay attention to the spe specific learning needs of female and male students. 
Um, and so uh, why does gender matter for pedagogy? Um, it matters because when gender becomes a pivotal lens within pedagogy, it supports more inclusive and interactive teaching and learning practices that balance both women's and men's participation. So uh, as part of the Tessier project, we've come up uh, with a two-pronged definition of gender responsive pedagogy. So the first part of this is uh, the learning needs of male and female learners are addressed in teaching and learning processes, both inside and outside of the classroom. And the second part of this is that uh, teaching staff are gender aware and gender responsive in their planning and facilitation of courses and continuously learning and reflecting. So this builds on the definition from uh, the Forum of African Women Educationalists, uh, but our de definition expands on this uh, because we're looking at gender responsive pedagogy, not only from the point of view of uh, the teaching practice, so focusing on teaching staff, but also from the point of view of learning needs, so focusing on the students. So we have this double focus on teaching staff and students uh, built into our definition of gender responsive pedagogy. Um, we have two um, pedagogical pillars that are underpinning uh, the components of our framework. And these are two theoretical pedagogies that are related to adult learning and gender. Uh, so transformative learning and the hidden cur curriculum. Transformative learning as a conceptual approach to adult learning that was initially developed by Jack Messira. And the central tenant of transformative learning is to support adult learners to critically assess and develop their own beliefs, values, and thinking, rather than being the receivers of knowledge transmitted uh, in one direction from an educator to the students. And transformative learning provides an ideal foundation for gender responsive pedagogy because it focuses on dismantling beliefs and using self-reflection to critically engage with key concepts in order to integrate new learning. The second pillar underpinning, underpinning our framework is the idea of the hidden curriculum. And this is an idea that's been around since the 1970s, and it refers to the unwritten or unintended lessons, values, and perspectives that learners absorb while in education. And this is often related to biases, stereotypes, and assumptions about the world. And more recently, the idea of the hidden curriculum has been used to look at gender in relation to higher education, uh, showing that societal discrimination and inherent biases against women are frequently replicated in the classroom. And this often happens as a result of unconscious bias that is held by both the lecturers and the students. Um, and Louise Morley advocates that pedagogy must explicitly acknowledge the hidden curriculum of gender relations in order for gaps and biases to be addressed within the curriculum as well as within the learning environment. So when we were developing our framework, uh, we drew on Fawi's approach uh, to gender responsive pedagogy in secondary schools. Uh, we also looked at a gender mainstreaming toolkit for teachers and teacher educators developed by the Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, and we also drew on work that INASP has done with partners in the past to mainstream gender in higher education. So we have a toolkit for this that we also uh, looked at. And so drawing on these three resources, we've identified seven teaching and learning spaces, which can serve as entry points for supporting a more gender responsive teaching and learning practice. So these seven gender teaching and learning spaces are teaching and learning methodologies and activities, teaching and learning materials, classroom interactions, classroom management and setup, language, learning spaces and campus life, and finally assessment. So that's one part of our framework. And then the second part uh, is looking at uh, six dimensions of gender. So we worked with a gender expert, Charlie Nussi, to identify these six dimensions of gender that impact on the seven uh, key teaching and learning spaces. So the sex dimensions of gender are gender as representation. Uh, so within this, uh, we've looked, uh, for instance, at how um, the gender balance 
is reflected in university promotional materials and teaching and learning materials. So how are uh, women and men, um, both um, staff and students uh, represented in promotional materials or in teaching and learning materials. Um, the second dimension is gender as equality or equity. Uh, and here we've looked at the gap between the aspiration for gender equality and equity and the reality um, at an institution. So we've done gender audits of ratios of women and men at the institutions we've worked with. Um, the third dimension is gender as stereotypes and conscien conscious or unconscious bias. So working with this dimension, we've looked at what stereotypes uh, needs challenging about uh, male and female uh, learners or male and female professionals as well. The fourth dimension is gender as internalized bias. Um, and within this, we've looked at how gender relates to grades uh, and assessment um, and the language that's used to assess male and female uh, students. The fifth dimension is gender as interaction and space. Within that, this dimension, we reflected on classroom settings and interactions. So for example, where students sit and who gets to speak more in class. And the sixth and final dimension is gender as power um, and empowerment. And within this dimension, we've looked at flows of power and knowledge um, and whether power and knowledge just flows in one direction, for instance, from lecturer to students or whether it, it can be multi-directional also between the institution and the lecturer and the teaching materials and the students and finally the workplace. So um, our framework provides a tool to consider um, the interaction of the six dimensions of gender across the seven teaching and learning spaces uh, to support the creation of a more gender responsive pedagogy. Uh, so with this, for instance, we can look at representation as it happened, happens in teaching and learning materials, uh, representation as it happens within uh, the classroom uh, and classroom interactions, so who gets to speak. For instance, we can look at stereotypes as they relate to teaching and learning materials or as it relates to campus spaces and campus life or the language that's being used by students uh, and lecturers. Um, and we can look at power and empowerment, for instance, within classroom interactions, within classroom management and setup, within assessment and within language. Um, so this pedagogical approach facilitates a transition uh, from gender blindness to gender awareness. Uh, and ultimately, the goal is to enable both lecturers and their students to become gender responsive professionals. And our framework allows us to work with lecturers to build sensitization and awareness in each of the areas that's included in the framework, while at the same time uh, working with them to develop a broader knowledge around key gender concepts and gender gaps in higher education and the research system and also the world of work where the students will find themselves after graduating. Um, and this then in turn allows us to work with lecturers from the standpoint of their own awareness and skill building on how to become more gender responsive in teaching and learning and what that means for their students so what the impact is and how they can support their students to become more gender aware members of society both while their students are at universities, but also when they enter into the world of work uh, and become future professionals. Thanks, Mai. That's um, a really useful overview of the of the framework and um, and how it works. You mentioned that there are other models that this approach has been built on. So could you um, sort of just remind us about what makes this model of an approach different from from others? So we've developed uh, this approach in close collaboration uh, with partners, with university partners um, in the countries where we work and where we want this approach uh, to work. So it's been developed and it's been tested and refined um, directly with partners and co-developed with university partners. Um, what we've built into our approach is this double focus both on lecturers and students. Uh, so because we're working in higher education and we've tailored this for higher education, we wanted to make sure that we had a view 
to students um, graduating and becoming future gender responsive professionals. So working both with lecturers and students to become gender responsive through, through the work that we do um, with lecturers to improve their teaching and learning. Um, and then finally, um, in ASP's experience, uh, working with gender mainstreaming and supporting uh, women researchers in Africa and Asia has shown us that in order for any gender related sensitization and awareness building um, activities to be successful, uh, they need to be complemented by also developing a broader knowledge of gender and gender gaps. So making sure that the people we're working with to build awareness and sensitization and become more gender responsive have a broad understanding of why this is needed. So we've built this uh, into our framework. So as we work with lecturers to work through the framework, we also build their broader knowledge of gender and gender gaps. Thanks, Mai. I've seen we've had some um, some really good questions. A great question comes through on the on the chat, but we'll come to that at the end of the session so that we know we've definitely got time to run through um, all the presentations today. So. Um, our next speaker is Professor Flora Fabian, um, Professor of Biomedical Science, Embryology and Cell Biology at the University of Dodoma in Tanzania. Um, and Professor Fabian is widely published in both health sciences and education. So Professor Fabian was lead investigator of a, of a baseline data study on gender issues at the University of Dodoma, which was then used to develop the institution's gender and anti-sexual harassment policy. She's co-author of the Gender Mainstreaming in Higher Education Toolkit, Toolkit, which was published jointly by INASP and the University of Dodoma. And she is the gender responsive pedagogy lead for the Tessier Partnership. Today, Professor Fabian will be talking about how the framework that Mai shared with us was used to redesign teaching and learning practices within the four universities of the Tessier project. So Professor Fabian, over to you. Thank you, Veruti, uh, for the nice introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Veruti has said, uh, we had a background data on uh, gender uh, issues before the TESEA project. And therefore, uh, we realized that uh, gender mainstreaming is just not enough to actually have a gender responsive workplace or a gender responsive learning space. And therefore, our main aim uh, was enhancing both boys and girls entrepreneurial and employability skills so that we build equity in economic participation. And uh, the approach we took using this model was through course redesign, where uh, instructors' uh, knowledge on gender awareness was raised hand in hand with the gender responsive pedagogy through course redesign and taking into consideration employability the critical thinking and problem solving skills were at front, but anchored by the gender uh, responsiveness. And it involved both students as future gender responsive professionals and staff or instructors as change makers. And this, uh, as Mai has explained earlier, we introduced the gender dimension skill through the course redesign and this took on board the lesson planning right from intended lesson outcomes uh, to make them gender responsive, the teaching learning activities, learning resource material, so that they mimic the workplace, but at the same time, uh, taking on board the needs of both women and, and men. And as such, uh, the interplay 
between students and, inter and uh, instructors in the workplace brought about knowledge of responsiveness within uh, the workplace and the, the, the learning space. So we asked ourselves, as Mai has said, there is no unidirectional flow of information and knowledge. And therefore we looked at the key players uh, through the student's life from the institutions to the workplace and how gender uh, power relations play uh, in these uh, uh, stakeholders. So from the institution to lecturers, to teaching materials, to students and to working place, uh, by making the institution or the learning space gender responsive, the instructor is geared to use and prepare teaching and learning materials which are gender responsive, that interacts uh, with the students, and finally the students to the workplace with gender responsiveness. But at the same time, we engaged the industry and the community to discuss on uh, what kind of skills are required. And we also interacted with the uh, industry and community on gender responsiveness. So the students who are leaving the learning space to the workplace, they have this gender responsiveness with confident and uh, uh, knowledge skills. The critical, they are critical thinkers, they are problem solvers, but they go out with confidence to face uh, the workplace. And as such, the, the, the uh, stakeholders in the workplace likewise gave us feedback and therefore there was a feed forward and a feedback kind of interaction between the institution and the workplace. And therefore, uh, uh, as uh, we mentioned, uh, the approach uh, started with gender sensitization by raising awareness, but embedding gender responsive pedagogy in uh, uh, in the course redesign. So we did not change uh, very much the course content itself, but the content in relation to gender responsiveness and therefore uh, building uh, staff capacity on how to prepare uh, teaching learning material that are responsive. And also gender sensitization to students who became champions uh, of change. And uh, the champions of change was through various uh, uh, groups, such as students' gender groups, mentorship groups, uh, and also some instructors uh, laid down some gains. And therefore, we also had outside activities that created the interaction between uh, the, amongst the students themselves and between the students and the instructors. And therefore there was closeness and close working relationships between the uh, boys and girls and uh, between the students and the instructors. But also uh, through the joint advisory group, we uh, brought on board both uh, employees, employers from the industry and from the community. And uh, through that, students were able to interact and uh, by placement, some of them, so that uh, there was learning from the, from the employer and there was also learning from the students and the instructors. Uh, we also did lobbying through the institutional statutory bodies where uh, budgeting 
for such a change is actually required. And therefore, these institutions which were implemented, implementing the project became gender resp responsive. And uh, uh, therefore, the multipliers will uh, later on train others and uh, the champions, uh, which are students, will continue to form uh, bodies uh, such as uh, business and innovative uh, groups for actually training each other and therefore taking what has been attained in the learning space outside into practical and interacting uh, with uh, the community with more confidence and therefore more participation in uh, economic activities. And uh, key results uh, from this model, the uh, students felt that lecturers were addressing the students responsively, both male and female students were being addressed and they were being allowed to participate equally. And therefore that power kind of power relations is shifting from uh, considering girls as weak, as quiet, into now active and participating equally. But also uh, the transformation uh, of these students to critical thinkers and problem solvers, because the participation in class, uh, which uses uh, models uh, uh, related to the workplace and uh, the assessments were uh, replicating the workplace and therefore these students became more critical thinkers and problem solvers, but at the same time, taking gender responsiveness at the center of, uh, of all the success. And uh, students continued to form more forums where they discuss, where they teach each other. And of course, uh, they started interacting with the community through the joint advisory groups and performing various activities with the community and the community appreciated the change that uh, has happened with these students who were exposed to the Tessera model of uh, introducing gender responsiveness. Some students uh, have reported and we caught a student reported that I have gained some form of personal freedom and the willingness to lead. I can now speak freely without any fear of being a female. I would say that I have experienced self-transformation as a learner. Uh, that was a quote from the students. Uh, on instru instructors' key results, uh, instructors felt really transformed and they as a result, it transformed the student. And uh, this instructor here is telling us that innovation in all aspects of gender responsive lesson planning has played a big role to him because he now is able to create uh, innovative uh, learning material and the activities that brings on board both uh, boys and girls. And uh, gender responsive language was noted by students, uh, especially girls felt uh, that they are now recognized, they are now given chance to speak and their ability uh, came out. They even started to be leading in the discussion groups and uh, in project assignments. So, uh, uh, as this model uh, involves uh, the, 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 the whole of the learning and working space, uh, it involves the training of more lecturers if we want to scale up, and that is the plan. Actually, most of the institutions involved in this project have already started scaling up by training more instructors uh, to use this model. But also, uh, we have to have enough teaching resources, which are gender responsive 
and therefore instructors will spend more time to create material change from the previous kind of material, which could not bring out uh, this gender responsiveness. And of course, internships for students and instructors. Uh, students who have been placed on internship have been the key uh, change makers and linking industry and the institution uh, for the industry to learn how this model have benefited students. Now, all this requires uh, uh, more uh, financial resources for scale up. And as now, our previous budgets could may, may not have included this, but because we have now have the uh, buying in of the institution and the industry, this uh, will be taken up into further budgeting to include the TSEA model for scale up and uh, scale out. So those were a bit of a challenge, but uh, as budgeting is brought on board to adopt the TSEA model, then this will become our norm of teaching uh, in our institution and hopefully other higher learning institutions in East Africa and elsewhere in the world. Many thanks, Professor um, Fabian. I have a follow on question, um, which is um, how, and I think you, you've touched on this, but other, um, other ways that you address the issue of sustainability and lasting change with the model right from the beginning. Oh, thank you very much, Verity, for that very good question. This is something actually that uh, we have been discussing as institutions uh, for sustainability and the long uh, uh, changing uh, kind of teaching uh, pedagogy. And uh, uh, through our statutory bodies, uh, the institutions have actually promised to support this because of the changes that have been seen and uh, our graduates. Last year we have those graduates and they had already start, started their own small entrepreneurial groups and also integrated with the, the community around and made some positive changes with the community. And this has prompted the management to feel that this is something that can be scaled up and uh, we hope with budgeting uh, to bring this on board as we do uh, curriculum reviews, then uh, this will be a sustainable approach in East Africa and elsewhere. Many thanks. So um, before we open up for, for wider discussion and questions, we have um, our third panelist, Sibo Esamada. Um, Sibo is a lecturer at Uganda Martyrs University and is the institutional gender lead for Uganda Martyrs of the of the Tessia project. Um, Sibo is a gender champion and is also a multiplier of the Tessia course design framework. So uh, a sort of teacher uh, teaching of, of teachers. Um, Sibo is a beneficiary of Tessia gender awareness. Um, self-proclaimed and, uh, and, and course design framework. And today he's going to be speaking of his own personal experience in integrating gender responsiveness into his teaching practices and the changes that he's seen as a result in the classroom. Um, so I've just seen that Acebo had dropped out and I've, we've just readmitted him into the, um, into the session. Acebo, are you, are you able to uh, take over from here? Uh, thank you, uh, Verity. Am I clear? Yes, you are. Thank you. <laughs> Verity, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mai and uh, Flora, for giving me the framework for my inputs. And uh, I'll basically present uh, three key points. Uh, one, it will be about what uh, the gender responsive pedagogy has done to uh, what, uh, how it has changed my teaching and uh, learning. 
and three, the response from the students and from my colleagues. So beginning with the first one, what has gender responsive pedagogy done for me? One, it has uh, made me conscious of uh, the needs of female and male students in comparison to the time before I, I took the course of the gender responsive. And uh, with this consciousness, I find that it's a must uh, for the consideration of these needs of students to facilitate easy learning. Two, uh, the gender responsive pedagogy has reduced my gender blindness. I won't say that it is all gone, it's a gradual process, but uh, tremendous, there's a tremendous uh, reduction of uh, the gender blindness. And uh, this is shown uh, by uh, uh, my tendency now to be more inclusive, to include both the male and female students as, as uh, compared to before where I tended to be exclusive. Three, um, I noticed that uh, there is a closer, uh, uh, there is a closeness between the students and, and the staff. I'm more close to the students uh, than before. Consequently, I find myself uh, not only acting as a teacher, I also act as the counselor, as advisor, as a friend, etc. because of that uh, closeness. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the gender responsive pedagogy has uh, given me an insight uh, whereby gender has become an organizing concept right from uh, the course uh, design, uh, the facilitation and assessment, I, uh, uh, gender is included and it has become like automatic. And uh, if uh, I don't consider it, I feel that something is missing. This takes me uh, to the second point, uh, which is basically how my teaching and learning practices have changed. One, now I focus more on a learning student as compared before. Before I was uh, focused on uh, completing the syllabus. I was focused on, uh, on the content which I have, have prepared and to finish it within the given time. That one has changed. Two, I pay attention to the classroom setup and seating arrangement. This tremendously contributes uh, uh, to the learning. And three, the student participation. Uh, before, if I inquire from, I, I had to inquire from the students, I will only consider those who have raised their hands. But now I, I also consider those who are quiet. And uh, when, when they are probed, they bring uh, sometimes very, very uh, uh, insightful contributions. And hence their, uh, their shyness is fading away. Three, I also pay attention to life outside the classroom. I've noticed that uh, the student's performance within the classroom is uh, abundantly contributed by their experience outside classroom. So if I notice that uh, a student who has been active uh, in the classroom as just their uh, uh, being active as reduced. I, I inquire and in most cases, I find that uh, something outside the classroom is affecting uh, their classroom uh, performance. Three, I also uh, pay attention to the sources, the sources of the knowledge uh, which I deliver. Uh, the question is, are these sources uh, gender responsive? Are they gender sensitive? Are they gender representative? Uh, 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 representative. Uh, before, that was not uh, 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 a question uh, to be considered, but now it's very important and it motivates the learners. And uh, uh, I also consider assessment. Uh, that is, uh, the assessment has to be gender responsive. Uh, the questions that I said uh, have to be gender respo res responsive uh, rather than just setting questions in a vacuum. 
I try to contextualize them in, 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 in the gender context of the needs of the students. And this is quite helpful for the students. And finally, uh, the language. My language has tremendously changed. Uh, before I would just speak and actually using the, the male kind of uh, um, pronoun throughout irrespective of uh, uh, the female gender. And that, uh, I, I guess it hurt a lot my students. But with the use, the, the appropriate use of the gender language, uh, uh, it, it has contributed to the active participation of both gender. And this takes me to my final point, the response from the students and my colleagues. One, students have become gender champions. We've noticed, uh, it's not only me who has noticed this, even my colleagues have noticed that uh, students quite engage our colleagues who have not been uh, introduced uh, to the gender responsive pedagogy, especially uh, the administrative uh, colleagues. This, when, when they use, for instance, uh, a, 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 a gender insensitive language, the students politely and gently correct them. And because of this, now those colleagues are also requesting to be considered, to be given the training, which is uh, a positive note in relationship to what uh, Professor Flora called the scaling uh, of the program. Uh, two, uh, using gender sensitive language. This, Students in class and outside class are quite sensitive. Those ones who have gone through the, 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 the program, the gender responsive uh, pedagogy, they are very sensitive on, on the usage of language. And if any of their colleagues or a staff uh, uses uh, uh, maybe stereotypes or demeaning uh, uh, expressions of a particular gender, they gently and, and politely correct them. Three, students have become closer and more open uh, with staff. Uh, for instance, after classes, uh, if I decide to go to the canteen and have a cup of tea, uh, students willingly join and uh, uh, sometimes the class continues there. It's something new. Before there was a big gap between the students and, and the staff and the students would sit separate and the staff separate. And because of this gender responsive uh, pedagogy, that gap has reduced. Finally, uh, there is no more fear of exams because this is not only because of the gender responsive pedagogy, but also because of the transformative learning, which is the framework of, in which uh, gender uh, responsive pedagogy feeds in. And there are some of the direct quotations from students. One of them is here. Uh, I wish all my teachers were like you. Uh, this one came from uh, an MBA class. Uh, they noticed uh, uh, from a colleague that uh, her consideration of, 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 the, of, of their gender needs helped them in learning, which uh, other staff who are not uh, aware the gender responsive uh, uh, pedagogy were not uh, using. Uh, the other one is a quote uh, from a colleague uh, from a partner university uh, to the project, the CR project, that's from Gulu University, that is Dokas Aloo. She said that I have been using good up-to-date books, but also bring in more live examples from females and ask students to find gender gap in a particular concept, discussing possible contributing factors and how we can bridge that gap in learning and even in the possible working environment. Uh, another uh, quote from a colleague uh, of mine from the Faculty of Science, that is uh, uh, Eva Mirembe from Uganda Matters University. She says uh, basically that she has been paying attention to this uh, the student sitting arrangements and uh, she, she avoids the female uh, students sitting by themselves and the male students sitting by themselves. 
So she's, she, though there are were, there were, there were few, there are few uh, uh, female students, so she ensures in every group, in group work, she puts there uh, a female student. Then uh, finally, there is a quote from my, another colleague of mine from the Faculty of Education, Agres Atwikrize from Uganda Matters University. She says that I witnessed a student teacher reorganizing the seating arrangement during school practice after he realized that girls were seated on one side and boys on the other. And to me, that is positive change in the way the students approach the issue of gender responsive pedagogy. That's what I had for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isibo. Um, one follow-up question for you. Um, how have the changes that you and other lecturers been making in your teaching and learning practices impacted, do you think, on the, on the wider organization and, and environment at your university? Yes, just as I mentioned from one of the responses that uh, students now, those the students that have been introduced to the gender responsive pedagogy, engage the staff uh, uh, members who have not uh, undergone through that training. That is a direct impact. And uh, because of that, uh, those staff who have not undergone through that training are requesting for, for the training. And in fact, we have done a number of trainings as a result of uh, requests made by, by staff, including uh, training the members of management. Thank you. Um, we've been receiving some really um, great questions. So um, we'll, we'll move now to, to Q&A from the audience. Um, and I will, we're trying to sort of cluster questions into, into themes as much as possible. Um, so um, we have a few questions on measurement and monitoring. I think my, there is a, a question from you about picking up on the, the interesting conceptual model. How do you monitor change against the framework that's, that's been designed? Thank you, Verity. Uh, so within the TESIA project, we've been doing this uh, in a number of ways. So as Flora mentioned, we've been doing course redesign as part of TESIA, which is where we've integrated the gender responsive pedagogy. So this has been working with lecturers uh, to redesign their course outline and how they conceptualize their entire course, but also more particularly working with them on their learning design. So how they plan um, a chunk of learning both inside uh, and outside the classroom. So uh, a, a chunk of learning related to a concept or a topic that they're teaching as part of their course. Um, and we, so we've been asking them to sort of plan for that and essentially spell that out. And we've been using an online tool called Learning Designer to capture this. So one way that we're monitoring it is by going through the learning designs that we have from lectures uh, in the TESIA project uh, and uh, seeing how they've integrated uh, gender into their learning design. So looking across the seven dimensions, so sort of in terms of um, the content, how they do uh, formative assessment in class, how they plan to conduct their class, um, the sort of the management of class and group work within the class. So looking at how well they've integrated gender into that. That's one way that we're monitoring it. We're also collecting what we're calling value creation stories from teachers um, and from students. So where they sort of uh, explain what has changed in practice. So that's where some of the examples that uh, Florian Esipo has been sharing with us about changes uh, in lecturers perspectives and students. That's one of the way that we capture that uh, and monitor the change, that, the change that's happened there. Great, thank you, Mai. Um, we have a couple of questions for, for Flora. Um, Flora, um, did you have any, and actually I think this would be a good question, um, Asiba, you might also have some thoughts on this, um, but Flora, did you have any difficult conversations when you were engaging with students and teaching staff, um, possibly even employers or community members, um, about uh, adopting gender responsive pedagogy? And if so, how did you approach uh, those um, difficult conversations? Thank you very much, Verity. Really, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, 
as we engaged on gender responsive pedagogy, as we talked earlier, we can we can hear you. you can still hear me. Yes, yes. <laughs> You're still there. <laughs> Something <laughs> went amiss on my screen. Uh, we started with uh, raising awareness because uh, uh, we had a baseline and we realized that people are at different levels with uh, regard to gender awareness. Uh, you know, initially some will uh, feel that gender is about women, but uh, we had a few sessions during the uh, transformative learning uh, sessions for the instructors. And therefore, yes, some difficult conversations, especially with regard to gender, gender concepts. And we had to clear them off. Uh, not only with instructors, even uh, with members of middle level management, uh, we, we, who we uh, were able to interact with. Uh, if there is no gender awareness, really, it's not easy to bring on board. Now we want to change the way we, we speak in class, the way we interact with the student. What kind of materials do we use? Do we use reference from both women and men so that students understand that there is uh, there are role models from both gender? So uh, after uh, that raising awareness, everyone then uh, would appreciate, sure, there is a difference. And uh, therefore, uh, with the integrating now gender responsive pedagogy, it was easy for people to try and now understand which material actually are, uh, uh, you know, building more on uh, inequity rather than equity and which kind of material resources, if I bring them on board, will actually address both gender. And we, you know, started with some very simple examples, such as the use of the various types of fonts. Some fonts you'll find that they are meant for big hands and so forth. And those are simple exams, uh, examples that actually created uh, awareness. And uh, therefore, when we moved into gender responsive pedagogy, it was easier for people to understand. With the industry as well, uh, you would go into the HR policy, it is nicely put there, there is equity employment and so forth. And then when you, you, you look into the numbers, not even managerial levels, then uh, they started now appreciating. There was uh, deeply, uh, you know, um, internalized bias, uh, which was uh, blind and therefore those are the kind of things that we normally need to bring on board before we engage actively on uh, gender responsiveness pedagogy. Thank you, Flora. So there's a, a sort of really important gender sensitization stage in order to, you know, sort of pay, see the way um, for, for gender responsive pedagogy. Um, we actually had a, another question, um, which is related, I think, which is where should a higher education institution be in terms of institutional gender equity before it can usefully introduce gender responsive pedagogy to its lectures and students? So I think that's, you know, I guess a question about base line and institutional readiness um is there is there something there that um you know, would be useful to pick up on flora yes i would say an institution can be at any level of awareness it can be completely blind it can be having some awareness depending on how far the institution has worked for us uh, we had uh, uh, some few uh, awareness raising sessions, and then we had the gender and the anti-sexual harassment policy. So there was some degree of awareness by the institution, but also the top management uh, uh, has a willingness to create uh, gender equity. Not necessarily that you will find women in the top position or things like that, but 
uh, once we start introducing that, then we are aware and therefore uh, when maybe searching for positions, then uh, this will really be useful for an institution which has been really gender blind and has received some awareness and has engaged on the gender responsive pedagogy to remember that uh, the, the internalized bias the, the, uh, can now be, you know, come out and uh, people become more gender responsive and the institution becomes more gender responsive. It's a gradual process. It's not an overnight thing. Uh, the project, this uh, approach has been implement, implemented for like two and a half years now. And you find, yes, a lot of people have been transformed. So we need to be patient. We need to make sure that we are actually embedding this uh, in, uh, in, in all the, uh, the, 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 the professions or the disciplines, not in only uh, maybe art or social sciences or humanities, or we need to embed this in all the causes. Uh, we, we, our, our, our approach uh, took on board uh, science causes as well. And uh, in science, uh, you can introduce gender responsiveness quite easily. Uh, you are talking of what kind of resources you are going to use, which are gender responsive. You are going to look at your space. Is your lab gender uh, responsive? Is your learning space gender responsive? How are you organizing your students? What kind of language are you using? So really, uh, it doesn't matter where the, the, the institution is uh, at the time of introduction of the gender responsive pedagogy, as long as we, uh, we have some baseline to know where this institution stands so that we know where to start. Thank you. And you actually um, very uh, smoothly also answered another question we had, which was about disciplines and whether there's, you know, sort of different differences there in terms of gender responsive pedagogy um, within certain disciplines. So, um, so two questions answered there with one response. It's <laughs> um, I think also just um, we following on from from Flora's comments, we also had a question about whether from the lecturer perspective, um, you feel that there are certain incentives that should be offered or, or were offered or could be offered um, to lecturers to adopt gender responsive pedagogy in their teaching. What, what do you see as um, the incentives? And uh, the question is also asking whether we really need incentives. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you. Um, maybe I share what it's been done then I will see if it addresses the question. Um, right now, uh, we have reviewed and uh, the recruitment policy and uh, it has been adopted, meaning it is uh, now working and uh, gender responsive pedagogy is uh, incorporated into it. Uh, also the orientation policy for both the students and and the new staff and uh, it's a requirement now that uh, every staff goes through the gender responsive pedagogy uh, training uh, and as such it is it has become part of the tradition of the university um, and uh, it's not something that is taken special that you have to be given something in order for you to, to, to respect it. It has become part of the culture of the institution. Uh, and, and no one is thinking of, of, of incentives uh, apart from just uh, delivering what is required. Because um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the students are gender aware gender conscious and if you are not they will confront you so you are far much better when you are you are, you are also prepared when you are armed uh, that is uh, my response uh, to that question thank you thank you so the the sort of undertaking of gender responsive pedagogy and introducing it into your work is incentive enough <laughs> um it sounds 
sounds like. Um, we have uh, questions, um, two questions that are related to gender responsive pedagogy and online learning. Um, Maya, I think let's let's um, turn to you initially about. Um, so the two questions are: Have have you looked at gender responsive pedagogy in the context of online learning? Um, and then the second very related question is, will online teaching and learning modify their proposed gender responsive framework since there are um, you know, differences in access to devices and internet, internet bandwidth um, that may challenge students' participation and also teaching materials? Thank you. So uh, we've started to look at gender responsive pedagogy in relation to online learning because we've been doing this work um, while uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, as we're all aware of. So there was a shift um, among our partners, or at least for some of our partners, to online learning as we were doing this. Um, and we were also, even before the pandemic, we were looking at sort of different ways that you could bring um, online tools into your classroom, even if you were sort of meeting physically in a classroom. So it was a sort of there in that way initially, but there's been a greater shift to online learning now. So we've looked at it in that context. And, and from our experience, our framework is, is still applicable to an online learning con uh, context, because it is working through uh, these seven teaching and learning spaces, which might look slightly different in an online learning context, but they still exist in that uh, context. And it's still relevant to also look at our six dimensions uh, of gender that in that context. Uh, and it's, it's a very flexible uh, framework. So when we're looking at teaching and learning materials, for instance, we're looking at how we can make those more gender responsive. Uh, so looking at sort of the references that are used, uh, bringing in more uh, female voices if they're missing in the materials. Uh, but alternatively, if it's not possible to find sort of a gender balance within your material, um, then one of the things we're also looking at, at is how can you use uh, non-gender responsive teaching and learning materials to actually have a conversation about gender responsiveness with your students. So even just using the teaching and learning materials that are available, for instance, uh, but then using th those as a springboard to have conversations about the stereotypes and the bias that might exist in those teaching and learning materials with your students, which is also a way of teaching in a, a gender responsive manner. Um, and in, in terms, obviously, of sort of um, access and participation online, that's something uh, that we're also looking at um, and that we need to be aware of. But there, if you're teaching online, your students will likely still interact. So it will still be relevant, even if it's not a classroom interaction. It might be an online interaction, but still to look uh, at gender with this, within those interactions that happen online. Um, I know Isibo might uh, be able to add some experience to this because I know at uh, Uganda Matish University they've had a big shift to online learning in the past year. So I don't know if you have anything you want to add, Isibo. Uh, yes, uh, maybe just to affirm what you've said. Yeah, we are doing uh, all all our transaction education transaction online since uh, it was an opportunity uh, given by the COVID situation. And we are continuing, and uh, even the trainings, the gender awareness training, we are we are doing them online, and uh, there is no much difference uh, between the online and 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 uh, the, the the face to face. That's what I would do. Uh, add. Thank you. Thank you, Asiwa. Um, so a question. Um, which I think uh, would be great to touch on. We've talked a lot about the experience of developing the model and applying it within the four universities within Tessia. Um, it, I think it would be really useful to hear from the panelists on where you see the model going next and particularly how transferable you feel the model might be to, to other institutional contexts. Um, Flora, perhaps we could um, start, start with you if you have some thoughts on that. Uh, thank you, Veriti. Uh, the uh, model uh, has been quite uh, inspirational uh, in our institutions and it is an easy model to follow and uh, we feel that as we scale up from the initial causes to more causes within the institution, 
it becomes even easier because uh, uh, during the development of the model, uh, we were kind of, it's the first time that you are developing the model and you are developing it and trying to use it. And then uh, as, uh, as multipliers uh, disseminate it and scale up to others. And then the multipliers now, when they are scaling up to other programs, which we are not initially on the Tessera uh, project, it becomes much easier now and smoothly uh, adopted by the new programs compared to how we started uh, with the trials and making adjustments here and there. So we feel that it can be uh, an easy model to adopt uh, because we, we, now, or we are now sure on how uh, to actually implement the model. That's how we feel uh, right now. Maybe Esibo can say something about that. Uh, what I, I may add is that uh, as we are speaking now, our Tessia project lead, that's Professor Maximiano Gabrano, shared with us a request from one of the universities asking us to go and train them. Uh, I think this is a sign of uh, scaling out outside uh, out of the, the uh, out of the, the institution, and from that experience, we haven't uh, uh, delivered the, the we haven't kind of uh, delivered the request, but uh, we are preparing. So I think after that, maybe word will will, will go around that. Uh, Uganda Matters University is doing something and uh, that will uh, definitely catch fire and to go on. And in addition, uh, we also have the Joint Advisory Committee uh, Group, which is a pillar that informs uh, the, the TESIA project. And in that Joint advice, advice, uh, Advisory Group, we have uh, government uh, representatives, the, uh, the Ministry of Education, and 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 uh, um, and the council of higher national council of higher education and and other stakeholders which which means that they are aware of what we are doing and uh, and 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 they are, they are encouraging and at a given time i think uh, they will will press some buttons which will uh, since we are two institutions in the country that have embraced uh, this uh, 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 pedagogy at a given time, I, I think will press some buttons and through those, those uh, uh, members or those points of influence, then uh, we'll use them to scale out the, 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 the pedagogy. So I see uh, a future of this pedagogy uh, uh, going uh, beyond the, the, the current uh, practicing institutions. Thank you. Thanks, Asilo. Um, Maya, is there anything else that you wanted to, to, um, to add to that? Uh, I think just building on what uh, Flora and Asibo have already mentioned. So, I mean, we've worked with four universities to implement this uh, in Tessia, two in Uganda, two in Tanzania, uh, but they're all sort of individual universities with their own unique characteristics. So we have a private university, we have three public universities, uh, we have some uh, sort of large institutions, we have smaller institutions, we have institutions that are very much embedded within the community uh, where they are. So we have experience implementing this framework um, in, in institutions of different nature and we've seen it work um, at all four universities we've worked with. And as Flora was saying as well, we've seen it work uh, across uh, a range of different subjects and programs. Um, so we believe, definitely believe that it is transferable and that it can work um, in, in any context really. Thanks, Mai. Sorry, I interrupted well, uh, interrupted you at the end there um, because I also uh, noticed a comment in the chat about considering training um, TOTs from different universities and other HLIs. And so I just thought that might be something to, to maybe pick up on because um, that has been, I think, part of the... Um, uh, the approach, hasn't it, in terms of within an institution training what we're calling gender multipliers. 
Yes, exactly. So sort of a TOT approach is the approach that we've taken in Tessia. Uh, in Tessia, we've called them multipliers, um, but it is the TOT of approach. So uh, training a number of uh, staff at each institution that can then multiply the approach by teaching um, further colleagues at their institutions um, and sort of becoming the champions um, for gender responsive pedagogy um, and course redesign at their institutions. So absolutely, that is the model that we're working with. So I think um, we we are coming uh, closely towards the, the half hour. Um, so I think let's just have one more question and then I'll come to each of the panelists for an opportunity to say any final um, points. Um, I think the, the building on this question about uh, transferability, um, perhaps a good final question might be what advice would you give other universities that are looking to integrate gender into their teaching and learning practices. So um, maybe again, we'll, we'll stick with the order we had before. So Flora, um, do you have any advice um, or anything that you think, you know, you might want to do differently if you were to, to start this process again? <laughs> Thank you, Verity. Yeah, the TSA approach of transformative learning um, is key to employability. And uh, this, these are the results that we got from implementing this project for the past two years. And this is the way to go. Uh, uh, students getting out, our graduates getting out of the universities, and they don't have the skills to interact with the community. They don't have the skills to interact with the workplace, the market. They don't have the confidence to initiate their own small projects that will take them afar, and even having the, the, the required skills. And therefore, my, my own call to other institutions, and uh, uh, yes, within and outside the East African region, is to embark on a transformative learning uh, with uh, uh, the key results being producing critical thinkers and problem solvers, but I'm carrying around gender responsive pedagogy. And therefore, if we, we, we want to adopt this model, uh, it is here and it can be adoptable as we have all seen. So we invite other institutions to come on board to earmark their own uh, POTs or champions or uh, 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 those who will uh, support in uh, scaling up, we call them multipliers in this case, but it's the same word as my says. So I would uh, seriously and honestly invite other institutions to try this model. And not only the gender responsive pedagogy, the gender responsive pedagogy here is the key, but we would like these students to come out as critical thinkers and problem solvers. And the methodological aspect that Mai was talking about, the classroom activities that mimic the, the real world on what the students are going to, to find when they get out of the institution uh, should be uh, uh, a direction for our higher learning institution. Thank you. Isibo, from your perspective, what advice would you give universities that might be thinking about integrating gender into their teaching and learning more strongly? Uh, just in addition to what uh, Professor Flores uh, said, um, transformative learning is the way to go. Uh, and uh, once you are in, uh, into the business of transformative learning, then you can't do away with gender responsive pedagogy or even if you want it cannot go away that's what i would say thank you thanks Isibo. um my uh what advice would you give uh i mean i think it's it's building on what flora and Isibo has already said i think what we found in in tessia is that 
we couldn't have done uh, this work without uh, dedicated people at each uh, of the institution who could champion this approach at the institutions. So in Tessie, that, Tessia, that's uh, been the project teams and then the, the, what we're calling the multipliers uh, or the TOTs. Um, so my advice would be to identify uh, the people within your institution who could champion this approach uh, and could really help drive it forward um, at your institutions. Um, and just following on, my, do you think that, um, I've seen we've had another question about whether this model works mostly for universities or whether also TVET or middle level colleges might also benefit from, from thinking about this model, whether it would work for them too? Uh, so, I mean, obviously so far we've worked with this model at universities, but we believe it would also be uh, applicable for TVET or uh, middle le level colleges. Um, the key aspect uh, or one of the key aspects of the model is this sort of look to students um, as future professionals. And obviously that's also something uh, that they're training students to become future professionals at TVETs uh, and middle level colleges. So, so we definitely believe that it will be applicable there as well. Thank you. Um, so I think we're, we're nearly ready to wrap up. We did, we did just have one final question, which we have touched on a little bit, I think, but um, comments about measurements and, and Mel um, from the project and how, I guess, you really measure the changes that you see. So um, I don't know if um, I'll open that question to any panelists about whether there is, you know, some advice on, on monitoring and Mel around gender responsive pedagogy. So I, I can start, or you want to start, Flora? You can start, my. Okay, and then you can add. Uh, so, I mean, we do have a very sort of uh, robust and systematic uh, monitoring and evaluation framework and learning framework in place within the TESIA project. So we are uh, collecting uh, a lot uh, of measurements around this work. Um, we're in the final year of the project now, so we're gathering uh, sort of the final set um, of data on this, which is going to sh show us the real impact now that we're sort of uh, three years into the project. Uh, so we will be sharing more learning um, as we collect this. Uh, but we're doing, as Flora has mentioned, uh, she's talked about doing a baseline at uh, UDOM. We've also done a baseline as part of this project with uh, lecturers and students to look at uh, their knowledge and practice around gender responsive pedagogy uh, and critical thinking and problem solving as well, which are also focus of the TESIA project. Um, and we're doing another end line to see uh, where those changes have been. As I've mentioned, uh, we're looking at uh, the learning designs that are coming through from teachers to see how they've integrated gender responsive pedagogy into those designs. We're collecting value creation stories from uh, lecturers and students um, that will show us the change that's happened. So we have a robust uh, framework uh, for collecting this in place and we're collecting uh, the information as we speak and we'll be sharing that once we have it. Thanks, my Flora, did you have anything to add? And no, I think May has said it all about the robust uh, monitoring and evaluation team. And this involves uh, across the partnership from INASP to uh, monitoring and evaluation teams from the institution who are collecting data and actually analyzing the data. And the annual, uh, annually, uh, every quarter actually, we have these reports, which actually details on uh, what kind of progress we are doing and what kind of key results uh, we are getting from the implementation. Thank you. So I'm just going to share, we've had some questions um, on um, getting in touch about um, uh, how to, how to um, work together. And so um, well, I just wanted to flag before, before we run out of time that we do have some papers um, that are looking in more detail at the framework that we've been talking today and also the approach um, to integrating that framework within teaching and learning practices. So there's a link here and I think also Sean has posted um, a link in the chat as well that goes directly to these papers. So that's a really great place to find more information about what we've been talking today. Um, but also please do um, get 
get in touch. Um, so the the person on the on the screen here is Jen Chapin. Um, Jen is actually she's a senior program specialist at INASP, and she's in the process of returning from maternity leave. So she unfortunately wasn't able to attend the session today. But Jen is taking the lead on INASP's gender work. So um, is is back at work now, and it, um, please do reach out to her, or of course to any of the other speakers who um, the panelists who've been speaking today. Um, we did um, share the panelists' email addresses at the beginning of the session um, on screen, and when we share the recording, you'll be able to, to see those um, email addresses again. Um, so I think that that is us um, uh, for the end of our session for today. Um, so as I mentioned, a recording of the event will be available. Um, Many thanks to all our speakers and also thanks to the audience today for your great engagement and all your questions. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen just so we can see our panelists again and just um, I just offer Flora, Professor Flora um, Estivo and Mai a chance to say anything else if you, if you feel there's one last comment you wanted to make. Okay, I think we might have covered everything. <laughs> so that's great. So thank you once more to everybody. And um, yeah, please do get in touch. I'm looking forward to, uh, to your, your questions and further discussion going forward. Many thanks.